Hello, my name is Suzanne Roberts and I am Head of the Counselling Service for the Macular Society. And today we're going to be speaking about visual hallucinations. So a visual hallucination is seeing something that isn't actually there in front of you. So it may be something that you're aware of, but the people around you are unable to see it. And a visual hallucination, which is caused by eye disease, is known as the Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, not everyone who experiences the Charles Bonnet syndrome will find the hallucinations distressing. So it could be that, for example, as you may see flowers, you may see patterns, and you may actually enjoy seeing them. Some people talk about being fascinated by them because they're, they're vivid and perhaps their vision isn't normally that great and they can now see something quite clearly. Other people will report to feeling quite anxious or feeling quite distressed. And I think this depends on what it is the person is seeing, how frequently the person is seeing the images or the patterns, and also the, their sort of support network and, and how they're managing their own sort of perception of what they're seeing and, and their anxiety around what they're seeing. So what we want to do today is to raise awareness of the syndrome because we know that if you have the information before it happens, and that's not saying that everyone with eye disease will experience hallucinations because we know that that's not the case but that if you have that information and you know what to expect, it seems to be that that, that sort of cohort of, of people will tend to manage better than those that were not made aware of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. So those people that had never heard of it, um, and never, nobody had ever spoken to them about it or the possibility that it might happen. Those people tend to really struggle and you can understand why, because naturally it's alarming to see something that you know would not normally be there. So we want to sort of ease some of that kind of, some of the, the not knowing and ease some of that distress for those that are feeling that way. And we can do that by giving you advice and information, or it may be that you come through to our counselling service and you have some telephone counselling sessions, or you could be assigned to a group, so a telephone group where you can speak to others who are also experiencing visual hallucinations caused by the Charles Bonnet syndrome. We can also link you with other organisations that, that may well be able to help you too, such as the Esme's Umbrella. So there's lots of different ways in which we can help. And we know that you love hearing stories, so real life stories, because I think that's what makes it real, isn't it? You hearing what other people are experiencing, what other people are, are going through. So people who are visually impaired, and people perhaps who have the Charles Bonnet syndrome themselves. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be sharing stories and hopefully either um, raising awareness, but also being able to um, alleviate any kind of anxiety or some of the anxiety that you may be feeling. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome Ken Castle who is going to be speaking to us today about his experience of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And Ken has both dry and wet macular disease. So Ken, could we start with you telling us when the Charles Bonnet hallucination started and also um, what you were seeing at the time? It started around the late August last year. Okay. And I was up at my uh, father-in-law's place um, huh? helping him with his care. And uh, at the time, because there's no particular curtains in this particular room, it's all white and plenty of light, bifold doors and that. I kept picking up these images on my mm -hmm. arms okay. at the start, like a pattern of a curtain. 
And mm. I kept sort of going, what's, what's this, you know, and looking around to try and match the image to the room. Yeah. And this lasted for about 20, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, um, John, the uh, father-in-law said, oh, can you put the box in on? So I gets up and put, I'm struggling with the telly mind. So I put the box in on for him and gets it mm -hmm. going. And I goes back and sits down and I'm still getting this picture, an image coming across like a pattern from a curtain. On your skin? Yeah, on my skin, mm -hmm. you know, and I was mm -hmm. looking and looking up, looking round. I couldn't see anything to match. Yeah. So anyway, I was watching the boxing and uh, I can't think of the name. Well, I think it was Frampton was boxing. Mm. And uh, all of a sudden, these two men, this is on the television, in raincoats, got into the ring. Right, OK. And I'm saying to John, who's that got into it? He's not got good soap because of his age. at 91. Mm -hmm. He said, what are you on about? There's just the breath and the two boxers. And I said, well, there's two blokes in the ring standing there with raincoats on. And this Did went you? on. Yeah, go on. <laughs> this went on for about probably the full length of the that round mm -hmm. of the boxing. And I, I went back, I went up to the television, you know, just to check that not sort of some double image coming from something. Sat back down, and of course I'm starting to worry now what's going on. Mm. And then it went. Right. But I'm still picking up this images of other colours, mm -hmm. curtains or something. And so that it probably lasted that day about a good two hours on and off. Okay. Did, and I, and so at, at that point, Ken, you didn't know what these images were no, or why you were having them. No, and no, had, no. And so nobody had actually spoken to you about the Charles Bonnet uh, no, syndrome? No, all I've ever been discussed was mm. floaters, kaleidoscope colours, which, you know, like it's like oil yeah. on water, isn't it? And it was from, I didn't realise at that particular time, you know, what was going on. Anyway, my partner come and picked me up and said hello to her dad and we went home. And we mm -hmm. sat at the sofa that night and she said, I was dad. And I said, yeah, he was OK, a bit quiet. And I explained to her what I'd been seeing. Mm -hmm. And then it started again. And this time it was like Russian, have you, you know, the Russian dolls, you get like five dolls. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm saying to Lynn, is, is that something on my arm? What were you on about, she says. And they were just sort of walking all over me. And I'm thinking, well, yeah. well, the only memory I have, and I'm not knowing anything about Russian dolls, when I was in Sweden, there was a set of Russian mm -hmm. dolls in the hotel, you know, in the bedroom, like, and I just thought, well, perhaps I'm picking up, you know, remembering something, because I had been thinking about work. Yeah. You know, when I was in yeah. Room, that was it. Uh huh. And then it started to, to that lasted a good, most of the night, I think, it went on and on. And um, I was due an injection in, a, I think, the following week. Mm -hmm. Well, in between, I started seeing people. OK, yeah. Average-looking people, children, um, just playing, skipping. Were they dressed in any particular yeah, way? Yeah, all dressed in sort of, but 1960s. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. And uh, I thought, what's going on? You know, I I just thought, well, I don't know what I thought at the time because I was in mm. a, a in a bit of a a low position. Mm. I think things were sort of like spinning round, and yeah. I really didn't take a lot of notice. Okay. And then I went to the Malaclia Society. Can I yes. just ask you, um, Ken, before yeah. you go on to the next step? Yeah. When you so you started having the hallucinations, and were there, was there any kind of a pattern in terms of how often you were seeing them? You know, was it daily, and how often were they there for when once they appeared? Oh, they were for hours sometimes. Okay. And and then yeah. in uh, most of the day. 
okay. you know, and yeah. I put it really down to being stressed out. Okay. And in the evening, mostly in the evenings at home, you know, because... So would you say that in terms of how it was impacting on you, it was making you anxious by the sound yeah. speak because you didn't know what it was. Did it impact on you in any other ways or on your partner or anyone else around you? All, all she kept saying to me was, don't be so silly, it's nothing there. Anyway, that particular next week, I, I had to have an eye injection. And I went. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question there and then. I explained okay. to them yeah. what was going on. And straight away, they said, you've, you've got Charles Bonney syndrome. I think yeah, they call then it. You, you had a diagnosis then at yes. that point. Yeah. Yes. So they did explain something. Give me a bit of literature, not a lot. Yeah. Just a bit of a pamphlet, really. And then I explained to them that I was with the Malacca Society. And mm -hmm. they said, well, we, we, we know about the Malacca so have you, do you go to the meetings? And I said, well, I do go to the one. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. And that's, that's then is when I found out more about it. Okay, so through yeah. the peer support groups, you yes. found out more but, about but it. Okay, prior yeah. to this, yeah. Prior to going to the next meeting, I kept breaking down, crying. Mm -hmm. Couldn't mm. understand what was going on. I was in the garden. And, uh, you know, is it, I had somebody next to me. You know, I, could, I was asking him, you know, what we're going to do with this bit of garden. Yes, yeah. And then the next door neighbour said, you, you're all right, Ken. Yeah, so it was no really way. confusing then yes, by the sounds of it, yeah. Yes. And then, then I... Found... Go on. Go on. I know then that you came through to the Macro Society, you yes. used the counselling service. Yes. You used the um, group and the telephone support mm -hmm. group. Yes. How, how did um, how did that kind of support help you deal with Charles Bonnet? Once I found out what it was about, mm. it was settling on me. You know, starting to understand it. The, the worst scenarios was when my friends you've met were leaving on the particular Friday. A Val went to pull away, and I said, "Stop! Stop! There's three kids in the road." Okay, yes. She said, what do you mean? I said, this, whoa, I said, this, they're crossing the road. Look at them. Mm. Three of them. So they obviously <laughs> looked very real. They were real to me. Mm. They were just the right size. Yeah. But the bit I couldn't understand was they crossed the road to the pavement. And then they started to come across towards the house. Okay. And they sort of walked through Val's car. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. And then they landed in my front garden as though they were like little midgets, little, you know, they'd gone from three, four, Ranging four in four, height. And they kept shrinking. Mm, okay. And it was frightening. I can understand it, that. that and, yeah. My, my, my friends, that they sort of pulled away, sort of, what's wrong with Ken? You know, I thought they were sniggering, laughing at me, but in the nicest way. Mm. Maybe they were concerned about you. Of course they were, yeah, but yeah. at that time I didn't know. They have explained mm. since. Yeah. This went on for quite a while. But st when I started to talk to you mm -hmm. as a counsellor, you put things into perspective and I started to understand it more. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that part of the brain's not taking any images and it's it's reproducing the past and things yes. like that was making it, it was more realistic. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing in my favour was everything to me was real. It wasn't yeah. sort of monsters or dragons mm -hmm. or anything like okay, that. It was all yeah. real, what I could yeah. associate to, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. And yeah, it, totally, yeah. So um, although when the figures were changing from being really tall to really small, yeah, did that in your mind sort of say, well, this, this can't be real? Did that, for some people, they're the, the times when they realised that actually I realised they were not real because they could walk through, you know, literally um, walk through windows, doors, walk through a car. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I, they realised. At the time, it was more about... The environment, you know, where I was. Okay. And trying to, because it was all white, 
no curtains, sun blaring in. And I, I just thought it, it must be something to do with refraction mm. of light. Yeah, okay. And you're trying to sort of understand yeah. it. Yeah. So did you get from sort of the group and, and the contact with us, do you think that, you know, the peer group, speaking to others who has have the child's 1a syndrome did that help you yes it, it once i started to understand mm. what was going on and i have to keep saying it, it was mainly your help in the beginning mm. and that mm. transferred to the meetings the that's group. the kidderminster yeah. branch meeting oh okay because i've told um, i can't think of her surname val who runs that particular meeting and we had a whole session on um, this child's body, trying to understand it. Some hadn't heard of it. Others had. Mm. And, some, and some people said, well, I, I've been seeing things. I didn't know that. Mm. You know, and there was some, I can't remember all of it, but it was a couple there that was quite um, gruesome. You know, I don't want to repeat these things because it's not nice. Frightening, yeah. You know, so, yeah. but but once I got to understand it wasn't dementia or was Alzheimer. I wasn't yeah. losing my mind, and I, I come to terms with it. Yeah, that's that. So, what would you say to others then mm -hmm. that are perhaps seeing things that they know are not there? Well, all I can really say is is ask the questions first. Mm -hmm. When people are diagnosed with the malaclia, from my experience now. You're not told, you're told very little. Mm. You know, you're going to have an injection, this is going to happen, or so forth. But they're not explaining anything mm. at the time. It's the same as when I had the injection. I didn't know what to expect. Mm. I thought I was going to go in, put my chin on the vision machine, and all of a yeah. sudden a needle would come forward. But no, of course it's not. You're on a gurney and so forth. But ask the questions you know i think this is where it lies it needs to people need to be informed now i know that sounds easy to say because at the time you're not thinking like that no but having that information yes may have made you yes. feel a lot less anxious yes. and perhaps more in control yes. and, and i think for all of us knowing what to expect yes no, but, yeah, but that's a really good I'm, point. Yeah. Mm. And I think the help of Malacca Society, especially having yeah. the going to their meetings mm. or having the one to one with people like yourself, yeah. can bring it out. Yeah, so the importance that of that peer support yes. and speaking to other people, sharing experiences. Yes. Yeah, and I yes. think, you know, what you're doing now is, is that in that you're sharing your experience yes. and that's what people want to hear. They want yes. to hear from people like you yes, who can say it as it is and sort of share, share your experience. Yes. And, and we all need to learn from this. It's about sort of raising awareness and giving more right. information. Yes. I mean, it's like, it's like having the white stick. At least people know mm. there's some visual problem. Yes. When you, if you're just walking arm in arm with somebody, nobody knows that you've got problems with your eyes. Yeah, yeah. And um, you'd be surprised the difference it made, you know, having a stick. The invisible it, it, disability, isn't yeah, it, of uh, that's right. macular yeah, disease. Yeah, well, that's right. thank, thank you for answering all of our questions <laughs> and sharing your experience. So I'd like to welcome Veronica, who is with us today, and Veronica is going to be speaking about her experience of the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And Veronica has chronic dry macular disease. So thank you for this today, Veronica. And I just wondered if we could start by you telling us a little bit about sort of when it was you first started experiencing um, the Charles Bonnet syndrome and what it was you were seeing. Well, it, it started a couple of years ago, roughly. I'd had hip surgery. Um, and when I came out of the anaesthetic, that was the first time I saw these, what I call netting, this pattern really, sort of a, a blue and gray pattern everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
um, I, 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 I said to the nurse, I, my vision was distorted and they put it down to a migraine. Okay. Um, they said it was quite common after spinal um, mm -hmm. you know, anesthetic and, and it dispersed and I didn't see anything then for a few weeks, I suppose. But then I started to see the patterns on the ground Mm -hmm. um, and I used to complain that the floor needed cleaning and then on the walls and the ceiling and it's like a blue and grey what I call netting mm -hmm. um, which is very common that something was wrong mm -hmm. and then sometime later several months later I saw a lady which she was just going into the supermarket dressed in pink and white mm -hmm. and I looked towards the door and I saw a little girl and uh, dressed like in a pink and white dress um and that and then she was joined by another little girl and I see those now quite a lot but what no one else could see it but I no. could see them very plainly uh, my sight was blurred but I could see the two little girls mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. clear did every you know deep. sorry did you know what they were at that stage no, I thought the little girl was in the shop doorway and I was concerned because that she was going to come into the traffic. And I, I, I asked my son-in-law if he could see anyone with her or if she was alone. And he said, there's no one there. Okay. And I, I, I was so confused mm -hmm. because it, it was so clear to me. Yeah. And, and then I became, when I saw the two of them and I started to see them in other situations I became frightened very mm -hmm. frightened mm -hmm. I, you know I, I started to think that well I, I thought I was going I was thought I was going mad you know what was going on I, I yeah. just didn't understand it well, how, but how what often I, sorry how often were you seeing these images then so was it every day or I know you still see them but how often were they there well Every day, <clears throat> I mean, the, the the patterns tend to be led by um, light. I don't I don't see it so much in electric light. So I've had advice on changing the the, the lighting in the rooms mm -hmm. and so on, uh, which helps. But the 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 images of the girls and so on, mm -hmm. I can see them half a dozen times a day in all sorts of situations you know um and to begin with i i didn't know how to cope with it mm -hmm. you know um, and, and i became very well very frightened and i didn't want to talk about it because i didn't get a very good response um from healthcare professionals and so I, I, they were very dismissive didn't mm -hmm. know anything but my daughter and we knew nothing about charles Barney syndrome at this stage Mm. And my daughter researched um, yeah. on the internet and found the Macular Society and Esmo's umbrella. Mm. And she said, Mum, I think this is what is wrong. And that was the first indication. You know, so it was really, it's down to your, your daughter doing the research. It wasn't that you'd spoken to a GP or an ophthalmologist or anyone had explained to you that, that child, what it was or what it is. It no, was your own then, research. Uh, yes, it was totally. I, mm. I was so fortunate to have a supportive family. Mm. And then I, I, I changed my optician. And I was very fortunate then mm. because they do have a low sight um, program. Okay. And yeah. I had a scan. And I, I said, uh, my daughter thinks I've got this Charles Bonnet syndrome because I see, you know, images. And she said, oh, yes, I've heard of that. And the relief was, I can't tell you, it was enormous. And then um, I, I spoke to someone at the Macular Society and I was lucky enough to quite quickly get on a, a, um, a, a group session um, for Charles Bonnet. Mm -hmm. And it, was, it made a big difference talking to others that had problems, you know, to a greater or lesser degree um, and we were able to sort of help each other, really, with suggestions on, you know, coping strategies and mm -hmm. this kind of thing. What, what kind did, of things did you come up with in terms of coping strategies? You know, what helped? Well, 
various things each person has their own lifestyle obviously but yeah. for my part I found my music helps a lot because I love classical music mm. and we did we we did um work on mindfulness okay as part of the group. and uh, that was a great help because I found I can practice that and all but also other coping things like looking away moving a, into a different you know, the situation and, environment. and various things. But I think for one of the things that I think a lot of us got from it, not all, mm. was, was to not be afraid, not be afraid to talk about it, to mm -hmm. open up a bit more, not to be so sort of insular, if you like, and, and which is great because you're so lonely. It's terribly yeah. isolating, um, and I think that 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 was a huge step forward for me, my part, to be able to actually admit that I was afraid. Mm -hmm. So that peer support sounds like it was really valuable. Listening to others and their stories and what helped, you know, what made yeah. a difference. It, it was great. Great. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were times when there was laugh, there was laughter, there were tears. <laughs> Um, you know, and some quite harrowing mm. tales from the things that people see. But also, one particular lady, we've stayed in touch. That's the nice. society mm. wants us to stay in touch, with, you know, so we can phone each other sometimes. Yeah, um, that's lovely. Which is great as well. And I've also, with my daughters pushing me towards it, joined a, a local group for um, in, in where I live. Mm -hmm. And that's helped as well, you know, to get support. It's not for Charles Bonnet, it's for low mm -hmm. sight. Yeah, but having that peer support around yeah. you makes such it, a difference. But the society encouraged me through the group sessions and so on to go out because I didn't want to. I started to feel quite, and with the lockdown and everything, I wanted, I, I didn't want to go out. I, I started yeah. to shy away from meeting people and so on and and I certainly didn't want to talk about Charles Bonnet syndrome because uh, people might think I was you know going mad or something it mm -hmm. was frightening I didn't, and I didn't I didn't know who I was anymore I felt I didn't feel like me you know because I'm not normally a timid person um, um, it sounds like it really knocked your confidence and I think Lockdown in itself knocked a lot of people's confidence because not practicing going out and about and using those skills. But that, I suppose, on top, top of that, having the Charles Bonnet syndrome, something that you didn't know what it was to begin with. Sounds like it really sort of hit you hard. Hmm. That's right. But the society helped me to see it for what, what it is. Mm, great. Not to be afraid of it. But it's images. And yes. Explained how this comes about and once I sort of began to understand it more mm. I mean for example with the green bus coming towards the car I wasn't really afraid I was startled to begin with yes. but I wasn't afraid because I knew it wouldn't crash into the car because it wasn't mm. real and yes that that made I wasn't when I saw the child if she's in if they're in the road in front of me I'm not afraid they're going to be run over because they're not real so, so now you can talk yourself through the situation, though, yeah. because you've got all that information. I feel I can manage mm. the Charles Bonnet syndrome better, you know, much better. And, and that's with the that, mm. yeah, and, and so I don't see, perhaps see the patterns as much as I did, because I found that when I was stressed or anxious, mm. they were worse. And, and is that when... Yeah, go on, sorry. Calmer over the situation. Mm. That, you know, when I'm tired or something, I see them. But I, I can manage it because of that, because I, you know, I can help myself through it. With the, it's a coping strategy. That's the key thing, isn't it? That you've got strategies that you know help. Like some people will practice the rapid blinking or focusing on something straight ahead of them and looking left, right, left, right. 
Other people will, um, as you say, like increase the lighting in the room. So anything that imp improves the amount of light or the um, improves your vision, if it's even very, very slightly, could mean that you see less hallucinations. Yeah. And also we found with the people that we've been speaking to that if somebody was highly anxious, and you can understand that if you're seeing things that, you, you know, in front of you that you know are not there, if they were highly anxious, often they were more likely to see more hallucinations. And that's where your idea of mindfulness or finding a really calm space and, you know, thinking about lovely things or whatever it is that you do. That's where I think that can help because it can reduce your anxiety. Yes. Mm. What, what would you say to anyone who perhaps is um, experiencing visual hallucinations they probably maybe they haven't been to their GP so it hasn't been formally diagnosed but what what would you say to anyone who was sort of in the situation of of querying things that they're seeing I would say don't be afraid to reach out and talk about it even if you do feel people are dismissive or you know you're not going mad and do try and talk to people such as the macular society because help is there it's readily available it's only a, a phone call away you know and and it's makes such a difference um but but i do feel cross that there seems to be a lack of information in the public domain you know you shouldn't have to be in that highly emotional state and trying to find out for yourself what's wrong you know there aren't leaflets available i wasn't given any information at all perhaps some people are it's probably patchy in different areas but certainly my experience was having to find it all i don't i don't know what i would have done if i hadn't had the family support behind me mm -hmm. and my daughter, to be honest pushing me into yeah. talking about it pushing me into making that phone call mm -hmm. making that connection with the society and yeah. then admitting that I needed help. Mm -hmm. and did you say oh, that you use the leaflet from the macular society to that you carry it with you now in case you want to explain to anyone what the Charles Bonnet syndrome is? Absolutely because I, I, I explained to it the society that my doctor was very dismissive mm. and they sent me the leaflet and said well next time you have to visit hand this over and say well this if she says if someone says I don't know what you're talking about say well I thought you might not know so perhaps you'd like to see this leaflet mm. and that's quite a help oh, well that's good that you've got that with you as well yeah yeah that that was brilliant because that was the first time I'd had any information written you know sort of printed information yeah. if you like. and and i wish it was more readily available you know what, that what we would like is that if, if, when everybody anybody is diagnosed that they're informed they're told about the charles bonnet syndrome not to alarm people but just to say that this is something that could might never happen but it's something that that could happen and obviously, we're really pleased that you've come through to us and you've accessed other services like Esme's Umbrella and, and you've got the support, so which is fantastic. Uh, it's made a big difference. I feel now, I, I began to feel I wasn't me, but mm. now I am. And, and someone actually said, one of the counsellors said to me, you're still Veronica, you're just a bit of a different Veronica, but you just got to, you know, get to know yourself again. And I'm doing that with the help of the society. And I'm in a much happier place than I was, say, 18 months ago, thankfully. That's so, so good to hear and lovely to hear as well how you are managing and how you are coping. But um, thank you for sharing your story. I'm sure lots of people out there are going to really appreciate and, and enjoy listening and, and learning from you. So thank you for that.